you ready to jump into scripture this morning? All right, let's turn in, the, in your Bible to Judges chapter 6. Judges chapter 6, and in true JD fashion, one more thing. I, I don't want to forget um, giving you, reminding you of the opportunity you have to give this morning. So you can give online, you can give um, right here uh, in the sanctuary as you leave. Uh, our box is on the wall, but uh, let me just help, just say again how much... Um, your giving really does expand ministry at REACH. It is making ministry happen. There are missionaries around the world, some dark places doing hard things um, that are doing it all because you give. Um, there is ministry that is happening here in our church, and in our community that's only happening because you give. And so we, um, we uh, love to talk about it as a blessing that we set ourselves up by trusting the Lord when we give our tithes, um, and it's true, but it's also um, an enormous part of uh, the way God wants to support his church is through your giving. So um, now, let's go. Judges chapter 6. Uh, if you're like me, so, have you ever had a year that when it ended, um, you kind of took a big exhale like, oh. You know, I mean, there's nothing magic about the year turning from one to the next. Uh, it might take you, like it does me, six weeks to remember that it's 2023 and not 2022. And every time you write a date, you, that last digit's going to be scribbled out, you know, and fixed. And there's nothing magic about this process of us going through a new year. But some years uh, cause us to do some extra reflection, don't they? Some years we look back and we feel like we've lived a few years worth of time or loss or change in one 12 month season. And 2022 was one of those years for me. As a family, we experienced more change and more adjustment and more goodbyes and more loss than we've had in a long time. 2022 was also a year of lots of new things, meeting all of you beautiful, awesome, reach church people. It was a year of hard things. It was a, all sorts of situations that happened in this past year that caused us to have to trust Jesus. And in fact, when I look back on the last few years of our lives, this day, New Year's Day, has um, kind of been a day where some interesting or some big things have happened. It's funny how little we can actually anticipate about the year ahead, isn't it? I mean, how many of us over the last week or so, as we reflected on the year, realized we had no idea what was coming for us? You know what I'm talking about? I mean, I don't know how many times this first week of the year, I think, man, this year's going to be like this, it's going to be like that, I'm going to start this new routine, or things, you know... Um, things are going to go this way or that way, and, and I'm excited about this and ministry or this for my family, or we're going to try to get this done in our house, and this year we're going to save X amount of money, right? And then what happens? Curveball after curveball after curveball come at us, and we sit in December and we think, what do we usually think to ourselves? Maybe next year, right? <laughs> it's really because we... I have such a poor ability to actually anticipate what's coming. I mean, a year ago, I could not have anticipated the way things would play out. There's not a single thing about the way my life looks today that was on my radar 12 months ago. Not a single thing. Everything changed. And yet, somehow, God orchestrates his circumstances for us, right? And he leads us and guides us and cares about us in ways we can't even fathom. It's what enables us at moments like this one to say, okay, God, I don't know what's ahead, but you do. I don't know what to expect this year, but you do. I don't have a good perspective on what the next 12 months are going to be like. I don't know what they're going to bring, but you do. So, so let's go. I mean, look, 12 months ago, our church was in a unique place too, wasn't it? 
No pastor just beginning the search process, wondering how things would play out, what the future held for Reach Church. Now you got a new guy who's been here for a few months, and we've got a brand new calendar year together. And I just believe two things for us. Before we get too deep into God's Word, I believe two things for us as a church uh, that God wants to do this year. First of all, I believe that God wants to, wants to heal us. I believe that God wants to do some healing. Not necessarily because we've been beaten up terribly by our church or gone through some enormously traumatic stuff, but more because some seasons just take their toll. You know? Some seasons just take their toll. How many of you understand there's a difference between the kind of injury we get from trauma and the kind of injury that we get from just dealing with a prolonged problem over a long period of time that wears us out? You know what I mean? I mean, I could go out here in the parking lot and uh, get in my truck and, and leave the church this morning. If I don't pay attention, I could pull out in front of somebody. They could hit me and just mess my knee up, and now I need surgery, right? But I could also tweak my knee and never get it fixed and learn to kind of walk with a limp a little bit and just kind of deal with the problem. And then what winds up happening? This knee is hurt, and then usually this hip and this knee is hurt. Why? Because I've been compensating for this problem. And it didn't happen because of some huge trauma. It happened because over a long, prolonged period of time, a season where I didn't let myself heal, I kind of got beat up in all sorts of other ways, right? And what I'm trying to suggest to you is I believe as a church and as people, as families, we need some healing from the Lord. And it may not be because you went through some huge trauma, although maybe you did. I think sometimes we just kind of get used to limping for a season and don't realize how much it gets us out of alignment. And so my belief and my prayer for you this year, Reach Church, is that we, we're going to experience some healing from the Lord. We're, as we wait in His presence, as we prioritize who He is and His voice in our lives, that we're going to experience healing that we desperately need. Amen? Anybody say amen to that? And I believe that at some point in that healing process, the other thing is God wants us to start dreaming again. God wants you and I to look around, reach church, and not just see what is. He wants us to believe for what could be. At some point in 2023, God wants us to embrace again, our calling in Pratt as a church. To stop feeling like we're enduring things and start believing God for things that we have not seen yet. God wants you and I to know his healing and then as a result, he wants us to start dreaming again. Amen? Amen. So I want you to turn with me uh, in your Bibles, if you haven't yet, to Judges chapter 6. Judges chapter 6. And... I talked to you a little bit about how much New Year's Day has had some significance over these last few years. Six years ago today, I loaded up my truck uh, and drove away from Manhattan uh, in, to go live in Nevada. It was insane. I was, I was going to be there without my family for a few months. And I just remember thinking, God, I don't know what you're doing. But I feel like I know you've given me one step, so here I go. And I'll tell you, I thought I, we were going to be in Nevada for two years. I was pretty sure this was a short assignment. Five and a half years later, <laughs> we loaded up our moving truck and left. And so when I think about New Year's Day, I can't help but think about how often God does things so differently than what I think he's going to do and how, how, how some things are so hard for us to anticipate. Even a year ago, I mentioned this to our, in our team huddle this morning before service started. Even a year ago, I was standing in a lobby in, in, uh, in the lobby of an Albuquerque hotel room. We were driving back from Kansas to Nevada, getting ready for an, another school year, and I'm holding coal. I've got a brand new winter coat that my mother-in-law gave me, and this guy behind the counter is talking to me. Uh, I'm talking to him. He's reading an interesting book. Um, and he's talking to me about like the cultural historical context of Islam and its role in Western Europe and Eastern Europe and all these things. And while he's talking, little Cole, who was a year and a half at the time, 
just emptied his stomach all over me. <laughs> all over, right? Oh. Parents, you know what I'm talking about? Like, there's nothing left. Ten minutes later, your kid's going to be hungry because everything they had in their stomach, you're wearing it now. That's exactly, I'm standing there holding Cole, and he, it was one of those, this is kind of gross, but it was like a silent throw up, you know what I mean? Like, sometimes they're audible, and the whole room knows, like, that kid just barfed on their parents, right? This was like total silence. Like, this coat was kind of weather resistant, so it took me a while to realize I was wearing, like, orange juice and pancakes and everything, like, all down my... Now, the craziest thing about it is as I'm standing here holding Cole, very unanticipated, unexpected circumstance, this guy behind the counter who works at the hotel doesn't miss a beat. He just keeps talking. He just keeps telling me about this book he's reading and how excited he is about this, this historical context of Islam in the world. And he's telling me, and I'm just standing there thinking, dude, it doesn't matter how magical the information is you're trying to give me. I'm done with that. Like... I'm done. You know what I'm talking about? He, this guy is as kind and as friendly as he was. He could not recognize the moment. Like, I am wearing your breakfast buffet right now. Our conversation about that book is done. We're done. I need you to help me get pancakes and bacon off of my shirt, off of my coat. And I, can't, I was thinking about that partially because it was a New Year's event for us. But I was also thinking about it because I think I know how it feels to be that guy because there have been so many moments in my life when I just missed, I just missed what was actually going on. Anybody know what I mean by that? Maybe it's in a spiritual sense. Maybe it's with your spouse that really just needs you to be present and paying attention or your kids. I've had so many moments in my life where I feel like I, I, it was as if I needed God to just like, hey, pay attention. You got barf on your shirt, <laughs> spiritually, you know? Catch what's happening here. And so many times at the beginning of a new year, I feel like I'm sitting down with the Lord and I'm saying, okay, God, help me not miss it. Whatever you're going to do this year, whatever is yet to be, help me not miss it. And if we're able to recognize in those moments what God is up to, I think what we quickly begin to understand is that God is doing something greater than we could ever imagine. Amen? Amen. And when we pay attention to that and when we, are, when we are able to trust him through that, good things happen. The book of Judges is fast-paced. It is action-packed. I mean, if, if we did a series of weird stories in the Bible, it would almost exclusively come from the book of Judges. We got a, a left-handed warrior named Ehud. He's kind of this spy, and he, and he um, shows up and stabs this king, and this king is so fat that his fat swallows up the blade, right? And Ehud locks him in the room, and he's like, oh, this guy's going to the bathroom, you know, leave him alone for a while, and he gets off, takes off, makes his escape. I mean, the story of Ehud is crazy. We got the life story of Samson, which is crazy, Jephthah and so many other heroes in this book that we call the book of Judges. It's wild. It's a bit depressing. At one point it says in the book of Judges, Israel had no king and everyone did as they saw fit. Can I just say it's the worst way for a society to exist. <laughs> And that's how Israel is living. At the beginning of Judges, we see Joshua has just passed away. This is the height of Israel's spiritual leadership in terms of being led by God. They are in the promised land. They are kicking rear ends and taking names. Like They are, they are a tough nation. And what happens is Joshua passes away and Caleb passes away. And then a, a whole generation comes in that just chooses to abandon the Lord. And what we see is centuries of this process of Israel trying to do life without God, and then they fall apart. They get caught up in idolatry. They get caught up in living like the nations around them. Then God allows trouble to come as a result of their idolatry. Then when the trouble comes, they cry out for help. Then God helps them. Then they serve him for a season. And then they slowly drift back to what they were doing. And they live this cycle as a nation for centuries. Over 300 years, Israel goes through this process. 
And this morning, the story we're looking at from the book of Judges speaks volumes to us about us recognizing what God is up to and trusting him no matter what. So I want you to look with me. Judges chapter 6, starting at verse 1, says this. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Now it's important for you to catch something. At the end of the book of Deuteronomy, right before Israel crosses into the promised land, God speaks to them a whole lot through Moses. Very prophetic. In fact, Moses at, at one point in the book of Deuteronomy says, God's told me that you're going to fall apart when I'm gone. So I want you to understand what life's going to look like for you if you don't serve the Lord. And he says, if you serve the Lord, you're going you're gonna to chase your enemies. Your animals will not miscarry. Your, your wives will not miscarry. Life is going to be awesome. But if you don't serve the Lord, all of those things will happen. You won't be able to defeat any enemies. You won't be able to stand up against them. You're going to have famine. You're going to have drought. You are going to have awful and awful, awful, awful time as a nation. And that exact scenario is happening here in Judges chapter 6 as Israel is chased from their towns, chased from their homes. They're living in caves, in the mountains, hiding out from the Midianites. Verse 3 says this, whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel. Neither sheep, nor cattle, nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count them or their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. So things are bad in Israel. So bad. And Midian is kind of doing this on a regular rotation. They don't want Israel to get any kind of strength. So they're watching from a distance. And when the crops come up, they're like, okay, time to go take the crops and kill people. When they see that their cattle is growing, they say, okay, time to go kill shepherds. Time to go, go kill ranchers and take their stuff. They're trying to keep Israel oppressed. And I want you to notice the language that gets used here in verse 6. It says, Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. Do you understand that what that language means is this? Israel finally stopped trying, asking all their other false gods for help. Do you see how it's kind of a last resort here? Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. God's chosen people, people that he had set apart, people that he had pulled out of slavery and given them this promised land, here they are a few centuries later and they're like, nothing else is working, maybe we should ask God. You ever been there? Man, I hate to admit, I've been there. So Israel asks God for help. And when they cried out to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet who said, this is what the Lord of Israel says. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians. I delivered you from all your oppressors. I drove them out before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites, but you have not listened to me. God tells them, I told you this was going to happen. You should have been paying attention. So it's clear here that Israel has made this mess for themselves, but then things get very interesting. Verse 11 says this, The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak tree in Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abizrite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. And when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, catch this, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Now, Let's just pause for a second. Because there's a few weird things going on here. First of all, Jesus shows up in the book of Judges. Jesus shows up right here in the book of Judges. In fact, that wording that we see in verse 11, it says, the angel of the Lord. That is not literally angel. In fact, the word that's used there is often used as 
messenger. And when we look throughout scripture, what we see is every time this phrasing is used, in fact, it's the reason why your Bible probably says Lord in capital letters, is it is representing this is not just an angel. This is not a messenger from God. This is God himself who showed up. Now, what do we see in scripture? The only time that God has ever shown up in flesh, what do we call him? It's Jesus. What do we see in John chapter 1? John chapter 1 verse 1 says this, that nothing was made that, that has been made without the hand of Jesus. What do we see in Genesis? We see that God is speaking about himself and to himself in the context of a we relationship, in a Trinitarian relationship. So here's what I'm trying to say to you. When God shows up, when, when the commanding general of the armies of the Lord shows up to talk to Joshua at the beginning of the book of Joshua, it's Jesus. When God shows up to wrestle Jacob and changes his name, it's Jesus. And when God shows up here in Judges chapter 6 to have a conversation with a super wimpy guy named Gideon, it's Jesus. Just know it's Jesus. Have we settled that? Are you with me this morning? Yeah. All right, second thing that's crazy about this in Judges chapter 6, Gideon is hiding out. Jesus shows up, but Gideon is also hiding out. Did you notice this? I don't know how many uh, of you caught this. He's threshing wheat in a wine press. That doesn't make any sense, right? How do you, what's a wine press? A wine press is a big area where you get in and you take your shoes off and make sure your feet don't stink and then you smash grapes for as long as you possibly can. The threshing floor is totally different where you're separating the wheat from the tares and you're getting uh, the crop away from uh, the part that you don't want to eat, right? So the only reason why Gideon is taking care of his wheat where he should be smashing his grapes is to trick the Midianites to try to convince them he doesn't really have any wheat so they won't come and take it. This is destitution. He is barely getting by. And the third thing is God says something absurd about Gideon. God calls Gideon a mighty warrior. A mighty warrior. I want you to just notice something here if you're a note taker. Mighty warrior is the last thing that Gideon would say about himself, but it's the first thing God says about him. And we know it's the last thing that Gideon would say about himself because later on in this conversation with God, Midian says, hey, I don't know if you noticed, but I'm from the tribe of Manasseh, which was not the biggest tribe. I'm from the weakest clan in the tribe of Manasseh. And he says, and I'm the weakest guy in my family. You know what Gideon's trying to tell God? Don't call me warrior. You got the wrong guy. Don't call me warrior. I'm not tough. I'm not brave. I'm not capable. So when God shows up, when Jesus shows up and he says, hey, mighty warrior, and Gideon's like, you talking to me? <laughs> I'm just trying to get my wheat out from the tares before the Midianites come and kill me and take all of my food. There's nothing brave about this guy in this moment. But God insists that he's with Gideon he calls Gideon a mighty warrior. And then in verse 13, it says this. Gideon's talking to Jesus and says, Pardon me, my Lord, but if God is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about? Now the Lord has abandoned us. Isn't it interesting how Israel's own decisions have created this problem for them, but Gideon can't even recognize, yeah, we kind of did this to ourselves. Gideon's forgetting that God didn't abandon Israel. Israel abandoned God. And here's what's so interesting about this moment. This is what I want you to catch. In this conversation where, Israel, where Gideon and Jesus are talking, all Gideon can see is where Israel used to be and where they are now. But Jesus is trying to get Gideon to recognize where they can be if Gideon will walk in his calling. See, God calls Gideon a mighty warrior before he's won a battle. Before he's punched anybody. Before he's drawn up a battle plan, God calls him mighty warrior. All Gideon sees is there's nothing mighty about us. 
Our story's terrible. God, do you see what I'm doing? And it's as if Jesus is saying, yes, but I also see what you can be. I see what you are, but I see what you can be. And I'm here to, to call that out of you. See, Jesus doesn't say, hey, you who could be mighty warrior. He calls him who he will be. Friend, find a little bit of encouragement this morning. When God looks at you, he does not just see who you used to be, which is what the devil would love for you to just embrace. And he does not just see who you are. He looks at you and sees who you will be under submission to the Holy Spirit as you let him shape you into the person he knows you can be. And he calls you that now. Amen? Amen. So verse 14 says, The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? That's crazy talk. To Gideon, that is crazy talk. He's like, no, you're not sending me. <laughs> I'm not strong, remember? Gideon says in verse 15, pardon me, my Lord, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my family. Manasseh's got a little over 30,000 fighting men in it. Within that clan, within that tribe is Gideon's clan, and within... Gideon's clan is Gideon's family, and he is the wimpiest guy in his family. Gideon is the guy where if you had a bad day and feel like taking it out on your brother or your cousin, Gideon's the guy that gets it. He's not going to fight back. He's not tough. He's not brave. And he's telling God what God already knows. And this is so similar to the conversation that God has when he calls Moses, where Moses wants to pour out his weaknesses to the Lord, and God basically says, Moses, I already know that, and I'm still calling you. Gideon, I already know how weak you are, but you're still the mighty warrior. You're still the one I'm choosing. In fact, in verse 16, that's what God says. The Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. Can I just underline why that's important? Because there were over 130,000 able-bodied, trained, weaponized fighting men in the nation of Midian. 130,000. Now fast forward with me to Judges chapter 7. Gideon is embracing his role as a leader for God's people. The time has come for Israel to prepare themselves for battle against Midian. And God begins by trimming their army down to a fraction of what they started with. Genesis chapter 7, is, in verse 2, it says this, The Lord said to Gideon, You have too many men. Now imagine that you got about 30,000 guys you know the army you're going to face is four times the size of your army. And God shows up and says, you know what? This is a good group of guys. It just seems like you got a little bit too much help. <laughs> There's no weapons in their hands. These guys are not able-bodied warriors. They don't have weapons. And God says, you have too many. But look at, look at what God says here. I cannot deliver Midian into their hands or Israel would boast against me, my own strength has saved me. So now announce to the army, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 men left, and 10,000 were <laughs> remaining. Ouch! 32,000 is about one man for every four Midianites. So Gideon is thinking, man, if we get angry enough, if we're strategic enough, if, if each of our guys gets lucky, if we could kill, each of us kills four guys on average, we are going to pull off the upset of the century. Now that sounds difficult, right? But it doesn't sound totally impossible. But I just want you to understand something. God wanted Israel to set foot into this situation knowing it was impossible without him. So he takes a situation that eh, is not entirely impossible and makes it entirely impossible without God. And can I just, I, I, I want to try to get this to land with us this morning. Friend, God is not above putting you and I in situations that are absolutely impossible without him. 
In fact, look at, look at the mindset Gideon has here. In, in Judges 6, he's like, ah, I can't do that, God, you're crazy. By Judges 7, he's already got enough people that God's like, you're getting proud. You're getting proud. So I'm going to have to take these guys away. Isn't that human nature? Isn't that the way we swing on this pendulum of like, oh, God can never use me. He can never do that in me. And then we see a little bit of success. What do we think? I got this. <laughs> We're like, oh, my goodness. No, just stay in the middle. Stay humble with Jesus, right? Like, stay low. Don't, don't, don't convince yourself you can't. Don't convince yourself you can in your own strength. Stay humble. And Gideon is kind of swinging on that pendulum here. In Judges 6, he's like, I'm the weakest guy in the country. Don't even ask me to do anything. In Judges 7, he's got so much help, God's like, you're already getting proud. i got to get rid of some guys. So like us, isn't it? So now, Gideon's got 10,000 guys left. That means one Israelite for every 13 Midianites. So we're getting into action movie type of numbers, right? Like, this is an inspiring story. <laughs> Each guy's going to have to kill 13 bad guys, but God's not done yet. In verse 4, it says, The Lord said to Gideon, There are still too many men. So take them down to the water, and I will thin them out for you there. Gee, thank you, God. <laughs> if I say this one shall go with you, he shall go. But if I say this one shall not, he shall not. So Gideon took the men down to the water. There the Lord told them, Separate those who lap water with their tongues as a dog laps from those who kneel down to drink. 300 of them drank with cupped hands, lapping like dogs. All the rest got on their knees to drink. And the Lord said to Gideon, with the 300 men that lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands. Let all the others go home. So Gideon sent the rest of the Israelites home, but kept 300 who took over the provisions and the trumpets of the others. Notice what they didn't take over? Swords, spears, clubs, rocks. They did not have any weapons. They had some food and trumpets. 300 warriors are now going to face down 130,000 trained fighting men. This is wild. God creates a situation that is truly impossible. In fact, Lisa, can you um, bring up that graphic for me? I got, there it is, right there. Now, I don't know if you can see this a little bit far away. This is a visualization, 300 warriors versus 130,000. This is dot for dot, man for man, exactly what Israel's facing with Midian. Now, even if you give those 300 guys AK-47s, they don't have enough time to reload to keep themselves alive. This is an irrational impossibility that Israel is facing. And I want you to notice... Because there's some real intentionality here in this test that God gives them. So he brings them all down to the water and he says, okay, have them drink water. And some of the guys, I'm going to just try to illustrate this for you here. Some of the guys drank like this. Oh man, I'm so thirsty. Awesome. Here we go. Ah, this is great. Right? Just stick their face right in the water. This is fabulous. I am so thirsty. Right? The other guys drank like this. Pick it up and drink. Now, what is God doing here separating this, these two groups of soldiers? Well, one, one group is satisfying themselves blindly. They're quenching their thirst without paying any attention to what's happening around them. Imagine we're in the heat of battle. Imagine that we've been fighting for about 24 hours. I've been killing bad guys and I'm hanging on for dear life. And I come across a stream and I am so thirsty and I'm just going to get a drink. And I don't think there's any bad guys around, but here we go, right? Bad guy shows up. He's like, easiest kill I've had all day. I mean, that's what's happening. I put my head down and what am I doing? I've quit looking at the battlefield. I'm thinking about my needs first. I'm thinking about meeting my own concerns more than the concerns of my king. I am not ready for battle. Who does God keep? 
for the guys who can drink and keep their eye on the horizon. The guys who say, yes, I'm thirsty. Yes, I've been fighting. Yes, I'm bloody. Yes, I'm exhausted. But there's no way I'm going to give up this victory. There's no way I'm going to forget that I'm in a battle. So I'll keep my eyes up, and I'll keep drinking, and I'll keep whatever weapon I've got in my hand, my trumpet. (laughs) I'm going to keep my eyes open. And God looks at those 300 guys and says, that's who's going to win this. Why? Because they've got my priorities in mind, not their own. Do you see what's happening here? God was looking for men who would pay more attention to the battle than their own desires. Friend, listen, here's what I'm saying. In our own lives, he's looking to do great things through people who are giving their attention to what God is doing instead of being zeroed in on what they want. Just like that, that, that time where I'm sitting there holding coal and he just barfs his breakfast all over me. I'm having a conversation with probably the one person in the room who is paid to help me with stuff like that. And he's like, I don't really want to help you with that, but let me keep telling you about the book I'm reading. <laughs> What's happening in that moment, his priority, the priority of the people who write his checks doesn't matter anymore. Why? He cares about his thing. As, as kind of a guy as he was, He'd have failed this test that God gave Israel. Just like I have in the past. God puts hurting people in front of me. God wants me to to believe for great things. God wants me to pray for impossible things. And I'm so caught up in my own needs or I'm so caught up in my own distractions that I miss what the Lord is doing. Friend, God is looking for people in our church, in our community, that will embrace His desire for your life first. And even when you drink, you're keeping your eyes up on the horizon, understanding that in the spiritual life, there are no days off. There are no days when the devil wakes up and gives up on you. There are no days when he stops trying. So don't drink with your head down. Spiritually, right? Don't get caught up in your own needs. Make sure that you and I are staying in tune with what God is doing. I got a spider on my Bible. So now we have Israel down to 300 fighting men without weapons versus 130,000 Midianites. If you're keeping up, that means every Israelite just has to kill 450 bad guys. 450 bad guys. And imagine being one of those 300. What does God establish here? Well, if you're one of those 300, you're not afraid to die in battle because that was the first test. You're ready to give this your best shot. You know the odds aren't good. Gideon insists that God's going to do it. And you don't have a single sword or weapon among you. Now for time's sake, I'm going to summarize a few things. God tells Gideon, hey, get up. I know you might still be afraid, so go hang out on the edge of the Midianite camp. And when you do, you're going to hear evidence that I'm doing this. So Gideon brings his servant and they, and they kind of sneak up and they listen to this conversation that's happening in the camp. And this is what it says. Gideon arrived just as a man was telling a friend his dream. I had a dream. A round loaf of barley bread came tumbling into the Midianite camp. It struck the tent with such force that the tent overturned and collapsed. Anybody have a weird dream that you think, okay, there might be tons of spiritual significance to this dream, or I should just forget this and and not let it bother me again, right? This guy has a dream that a big old chunk of cheap bread, cheap barley bread, destroys his tent. And he tells his friend, the fellow Midianite, and his friend responds with, well, this can be nothing other than the sword of Gideon. God has given the Midianites into Gideon's whole, the whole Midianite camp into his hands. Only God can communicate to Gideon that way. By the way, the significance here is that barley was kind of a cheap bread. It was the poorest grain that was used in this day. It was mostly fed to cattle or dogs. So the symbolism was clear to these Midianites that someone who has no business defeating us is going to roll in here and defeat us without weapons. When Gideon heard the dream and its interpretation, he bowed down and worshipped Then he returned to the camp of Israel and called out, Get up! The Lord has given the Midianite camp into your hands. Still no weapons. Divides the 300 men into three companies. He placed trumpets and empty jars in the hands of all of them with torches inside. 
imagine this. Imagine this. You're going up against one of the most capable armies in the world and God gives you a trumpet and a pot and a torch. You know, and you're thinking like, I might, I might whack a couple of guys with a trumpet. The pot's like a one-time thing. Like I throw that and it's done, right? And the torch, I mean, I guess I light it and try to burn people. Like, you know, we'll just kind of see how this goes, right? But the promise that God had made to them was more than enough. So Gideon tells them, he says, follow my lead. When I get to the edge of the camp, do exactly what I do. And so Gideon um, communicates with these guys. and tells them to hold their torches in their left hands. And in their right hands, they're holding their trumpets. And they were meant to... Sh- Blow the trumpet and shout, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. So they stand there and they shout and they declare God's victory. And what winds up happening is that the Midianites kill themselves. The Midianites and the Amalekites turn on each other. Israel doesn't need a sword in their hands because God turns the tools of the enemy against himself. And the enemy destroys himself in battle. 130,000 soldiers begin to kill themselves. All of a sudden, there is an abundance of available swords, right? So their armies fled, and Israel begins to give chase to them. Now, here's what I believe God would have us hear this morning in this story as we wrap up. This is what I want you to catch. From the moment God called Gideon to the moment the Midianites were defeated, God did not spend a single moment with these inexperienced soldiers teaching them battle strategy. Do you see that? In Judges 6 and Judges 7, God has an army that is a fraction of the size of the Midianites. And these guys don't fight, they lose. And they don't have weapons. But if you look in Judges 6 and 7, here's what you don't see. There's not a single moment we see where God says, here's how to fight wars. Here's how to do hand-to-hand combat. Here's the secret move I'm going to give you. God does not invest a bunch of time in these very inexperienced soldiers training them. He does not create majestic super weapons to put in their hands. God doesn't do any of that. What he did do was spend the time between Gideon's calling and the army's victory doing one thing. Building everyone's trust. It's the only thing God does. The only thing God does to prepare Israel to win the battle against one of the biggest armies on the face of the planet at the time is build their trust the biggest weapon that these 300 guys were going to have was the very simple belief that God had already given them victory. It's the only weapon God invested in them. The army goes from 32,000, from one man, Gideon, to 32,000 men. They're starting to feel confident, but not in God. They feel confident in themselves, so God trims it down to 10,000, then down to 300. Why? Because that 300 had to believe that only God could do it. That was all they needed. All they needed was to build their trust in God. Listen, can I just drive this home for you, friend? There is no greater, more powerful weapon in the life of a believer than their trust in God to do impossible things. All of the weapons, all of the training, all of the strategy would not have made a difference if Gideon and his 300 men did not believe. Do you understand that? There's not a single shred of training that would enable 300 warriors to defeat 130,000. 
They did not have, there's not a single weapon that would have replaced their belief in what God had already told Gideon. So God spends this entire time stretching their faith, building their trust, getting them to believe that the impossible with God is possible. And that's really what I want you to understand as 2023 gets started today. That we as Reach Church need to be the people that stubbornly believe that God is up to something great. Even when the circumstances look bleak. And even when the last time you prayed for somebody, God didn't heal them. Stubbornly believe. Even when the last time you tried to talk about Jesus and you didn't feel like it came out right, stubbornly believe and try it again. Even though it feels like you've had a long history of losing, God is looking for people that will stubbornly believe that he is still up to something great. Even when our finances and our health struggle, even when our relationships struggle, God did so much promising to Gideon before he brought victory. The only thing Gideon had to do was believe that God meant what he said. And that's exactly what he's inviting us to do this year. I mean, man, I want to stand in front of you as a pastor who knows exactly what's going to happen this year. <laughs> I didn't even know what was going to happen in our first five months here. I, mean, I had cur enough curveballs that I'm like, I don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. What I do know is this, that if we as a church will decide, just decide, God, I'm going to believe you are always up to something good. No matter how hard it is, I'm going to keep believing. I will be the last one to give up on you. If we as a church will be that, we're going to see God do things we haven't seen yet. We're going to see God do things we haven't seen yet. In Matthew 14, I'm wrapping up with this. In Matthew 14, I think one of the greatest miracles of Jesus' ministry happens. He sends his disciples in a boat and tells them to go on across to the other side. If you were... If you've been to our Wednesday night prayer meetings, you know, we had a whole conversation about Jesus and the way he brought his disciples to the other side of the Sea of Galilee where um, it was not Jewish people, plenty of pagan people, um, and the ministry that he did there. So he crams him into a boat after he does a miracle and, and uh, multiplies loaves and fishes for, for Jewish people, sends his disciples across the lake and dismisses the crowd. And he sends them across knowing that a storm was coming for them. It's another one of those moments that's kind of tough, kind of like the book of Judges, right? Jesus knows a storm is coming and specifically tells his disciples, go out in that. I think if you're like me, you have this tendency to think, well, God doesn't, God doesn't want me to have to go th through storms. That's not true. That's not true at all. He sends the disciples into the storm, right? And then what winds up happening? Jesus takes a walk on the Sea of Galilee, right? So he's walking in the lake. And it says this in 1426, when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. And then maybe one of the best moments of Peter's life, verse 28, he says, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. I love Matthew's response. Matthew records Jesus as having one word response. Come. Jesus, if it's you, tell me to come. Okay. <laughs> come on. Come out here. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. There's so much that happens here in this miracle, because this is like the best and worst of Peter happening just seconds apart. You know, he, he, he is so impulsively faithful. He's like, Jesus, I'll kill somebody for you. If that's you, let me walk on water. 
Jesus is like, do it. He's like, here I come, right? Just jumps out. The best of Peter, and it collides with the worst of Peter. Why? Because in, in, in the first moment of hardship, he's like, oh, forget it. And I think when I read this, as we finish up, when I read this story, I think about Jesus walking with Peter in Matthew 14. I think about Gideon in Judges chapter 6 and 7. Here's what I'm thankful for. That as Peter is swinging on that pendulum between intense faith and then intense doubt, Jesus reaches out for him. Jesus reaches out for him. In Judges 6, when God calls Gideon a mighty warrior, and Gideon's like, you got the wrong guy. God doesn't listen to him. And when Gideon asks God for confirmation after confirmation to prove that he really is doing this, somehow God is patient enough with Gideon and confirms for him over and over again. Friend, do you know what I'm trying to say to you? I'm trying to say this. If you have failed miserably in your faith before, it is not too late to try again. You serve a God who looks at you and does not see someone who fails he sees someone that he knows if they will trust him, they will succeed. You serve a God that does not simply see who you have been and who you are, but in an instant he sees who you will be when you trust him. So my invitation to you as our church today on New Year's Day 2023 is this. Let's be that church. Let's be that church that believes. Let's be that church that is stubborn in our faith. Let's be the church that's the last church to give up believing. Let's be the people who believe God is up to something in Pratt and he wants to use Reach Church to do it. Amen? Amen. No matter what we faced, no matter how many times it hasn't gone, we feel like maybe we struggled in the past or we failed or God didn't do what we wanted him to do. Can we stubbornly recommit ourselves to believing he's always up to something good? Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we, we pause in this moment and we recognize that in so many ways we're not much different than Gideon. We can list for you all the reasons why you should choose someone else. We can list for you all the examples of times that we've put our priorities in front of yours, that we've put our distractions ahead of you, your will. Yet, God, in your kindness, you extend your hand to us and you call us mighty warrior. And you don't just believe that there's greatness ahead for us. You know there is. So, Lord, in this moment, God, I just pray. That you'd grow our faith. I pray that you grow our faith, Lord Jesus. I pray, God, that when things feel bleak like they did for Gideon in Judges 6, may we not believe our circumstances more than we believe you. Lord, that maybe when we take a step of faith and, and we see you move, but then things get hard, may we not be like Peter and begin to panic and let the waves overwhelm us. God, may we keep our eyes on you, Jesus. Lord, we are staring down a year that only you know what's coming. Only you know. So may we hold so tight to you, Jesus. May we hold so tight to you, God. May we not worry, may we not panic, but may we just trust know that you are good, know that you are not surprised, know that you are able to carry us through every season. Lord, for those that are here this morning that are far from you, those that don't know you, those that are losing to sin again and again and again, God, Lord, I just pray right now in Jesus' name that they would trust you with their lives, that they'd confess their sin, Lord, that they'd 
make the decision to follow you, God, that they would give you everything they've got. Lord, may we see this year be the best year we've had as a church. May it start with us stubbornly believing that you have a great plan and you want to use us to make it happen. Jesus, holy name we pray. Amen. Hey, thanks for sticking with us this morning, Reach Church. We love you. Uh, Happy New Year. Let's believe for some great things. Amen. This week starts us kind of back in our normal weekly routine. So we got Wednesday night prayer happening at 7. We got motion student ministries happening, Reach Kids, lots of great things going on. So God bless you, church. We love you. We hope you have a great, great rest of your week.